So it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, Brad Pate, uh, who's the Chief Medical Officer uh, from Inviva Scribe. I'm going to talk about MRD use in AML, which is somewhat a new concept, but I think there's some landmark articles that came out this year that have really changed how we manage this disease. AML, the take-home point is that it's a very heterogeneous disease. There, um, you can't box AML into just one prognosis. And so anything you can do to improve the modeling, the overall survival, and the risk stratification is key. Because you can imagine if you have a poor risk AML patient that you think is maybe um, not in an intermediate group, and one that's positive, and you try to do a drug trial, you could actually destroy the clinical trial based on poor risk stratification. Also, uh, MRD, hopefully in the future, will be a surrogate endpoint that you can use for drug development and approval process. And then also I want to put in the con um, construct of targeted therapy, that there's new PLT3 inhibitors are coming to the market that will be changing the nature and how we treat this disease process. And then we'll go into the PLT3 uh, assay itself. And we've known about MRD for a long time. This paper came out in 2010, so the significance of MRD often outperforming all the genomic classifications. Because what is MRD really? It's basically you gave the patient uh, a therapy, and there's a clone that is resistant to that therapy. And through evolution, that clone is going to increase and eventually cause most of the, the um, mortality. Um, again, AML is gaining steam with MRD, which is often not seen in this disease process. And this was shown in an MPM1 RQPCR um, assay, showing the significant difference in survival between um, MRD negative and MRD positive patients. Um, Again, um, bone marrow is better than peripheral blood. And what this um, shows is essentially the, the level of MPM1 um, help decide when people relapse. Um, I think this um, paper that came out this year in the Journal of Clinical Oncology by Rocky really changes bone marrow transplantation in the United States. So what this uh, paper um, showed was that if you take, um, this is the Rocky paper, and this is a um, paper that came out of the NIH showing similar data, that we used to think if you take an AML patient with active disease, they're going to do very poorly if you try to transplant them. So maybe you need to do some other um, therapy to try to get rid of the clones so you don't have measurement. But the case is even more important is, look how, how MRD is almost exactly like active disease. And so, if you're going to essentially design a trial, maybe just decide what optimal conditioning therapy is or some other who should take to transplant and not, and you don't do MRD testing, there's no way you're really going to be able to evaluate the study. So I think um, as pathologists, hemopathologists, oncologists, that MRD is now here to stay in transplant medicine for AML, which is really a really novel thing that hasn't been done previously up until this year. Um, this paper shows, again, how important MRD is. If you look at univariant analysis with MRD, it trumps everything, even age, in terms of overall survival and event-free survival. Now, granted, when you take um, basic uh, markers and um, covariance that we're used to, uh, the model C statistic was 0 0.65, 0 0.69. It only didn't really improve much with MRD status. But what the authors really showed from the SWOG study is that, think about maybe MRD, that they showed that if you did subsequent intervals every three to six months, the models vastly improved to 0 0.75, 0 0.77. So you can see that we're still sort of in the beginning stages of understanding how to use MRD, but I think what this really shows in the previous studies is that it's important in AML. Um, lastly, also, just to build more of the case for MRD, uh, the, the government, all of our organizations want to be able to share the data to improve our modeling process. And if we don't have the critical variants that capture most of the drivers, this isn't going to be, this isn't going to work. And it has to be throughout. So let's just skip to why FLT3 ITD MRD is a really good marker. And I think that's really about targeted therapy. You know, the ratified trial um, was shown in ASH last year, showing a 23% benefit with metasortin. Um, 
And I think what we're going to be seeing is, is how to best use targeted therapy that's going to be expensive and in tracking patients who should be on, who should be off, who should go to transplant. Um, and also, this is just building with FLT3 inhibitors is the Stellis. Um, uh, drugs are coming out that also um, are using uh, different companion diagnostic from Vivoscribe. So let's just get into the FLT3 assay itself. Um, again, it needs to be really worldwide lab that can be easily available to many different uh, oncologists community. You know, clearly there's a set sequence of laboratory analytical validity, and we've done that uh, with the FLT3 ITD MRD assay, where essentially you see very good linearity as you serially dilute against the wild type FLT3 and the high R squared. And if you look here, there's this about 250 samples showing an excellent positive detection rate, as well as the limit of blank showing really no false positive. Again, sensitivity and specificity um, are excellent. Uh, it will be interesting um, with this um, if this is going to continue to improve as we get more samples. So let's get into the fun stuff, the clinical, which actually really makes a difference and has been shown with our partners. So here's a gentleman, 63-year-old man, relatively uh, considered the young. If you're considered under 65, you take the transplant. He had normal cytogenetics, that intermediate uh, phenotype, but the FLT3 essentially made it a little bit more risk. He was inducted with 7.3 and he went into remission. And then unfortunately he relapsed, um, which we could have probably predicted with our MRD assay. And then he was enrolled on a protocol went back into remission, so they felt comfortable to take him to transplant. Now the thing that's really interesting here is that the morphology basically went to complete remission, um, but the ITD, um, and it, it wasn't detected by standard of the clinical assays, but it was present on the NGS-based MRD assay. And so the oncologist actually changed the management and continued uh, maintenance therapy was initiated and is still on maintenance therapy, um, and this slide needs to be updated, but today. Again, uh, another patient, young, 42, normal cytogenetics, FLT3, and you're gonna take a, this young individual with um, this high-risk variant to transplant um, after remission, and then enroll on a FLT3 inhibitor. But this is a great story, right? These drugs are gonna be really expensive, targeted therapy, and just think about the cost, you know, there's always this talk about cost with the diagnostic assay. And think about that this patient and the physician, they felt comfortable about stopping therapy because the NGS MRD assay was negative, not detectable. So let's talk about, um, we have even more samples that we'd love to share their stories and create partners to even get more, like a 250 sample so we can publish. But what you see here is a number of patients, and they had various ITD lengths with very allelic ratios, and all the follow-up samples were negative. So in remission, right? And they should hopefully do well. But we know that most patients we could expect would relapse. And look at how they differentiate when you use the MRD assay. So essentially, um, when they're basically detected, they're either on treatment or unfortunately died, or, um, or relapsed and died. But look at this group right here, and you can ma imagine the hazard ratio and what this graph can really look like with MRD positive or MRD negative. And see how essentially these aren't being detected and these people are essentially disease-free doing well. So I didn't have a chance to talk about the MPM1 assay, but I think that too, if you look at really FLT3 and MPM1, you're talking over 50% of all AML patients could have an MRD assay that we can provide for you. So this is a sea change. Like part of this, I think there's two things to come away with. One is MRD is here to stay in AML. And I tried briefly to show you about the Rocky paper and also the SWOG study. But many oncologists now are looking at basically, if you're getting into the really $200,000 transplant at 100 days versus uh, consolidation chemotherapy and how you're choosing, you're using MRD to make those choices. So um, we need partners to help validate these assays and really build on what the quantitative measures actually translate to when um, the prognosis is, when they may or may not um, 
go back into active disease. And these are various trials that we think would be interesting that demonstrate MRD use in myeloid neoplasm. We offer a very sensitive and specific methods for MRD to track clonotype sequences and gene variants that drive these um, pathologic processes. We offer various products that um, lipid track assays that people can use to, to bring this care into the clinic in real time. And we also offer services like FLT3 ITD, MRD, which I just talked about. Please go to our poster about NPM1 that's going to be coming. Um, it's an REO product at this point. And we have other MRD assays that um, we're thinking about and talking about. All right. Thanks.